I'm not talking about automating anything, just the non-automated portion right now, the post editing, which is what they pay for, they're going to cost, is not something they track. This one, though, really stood out because, again, it's the first time I heard the term outperforming units. One company definitely not using machine translation uh, in any part of their operations right yet is Babylon Health. Welcome to Slater Pod 38, the language industry podcast, where today we're going to be talking a lot about machine translation, but we also talk about funding and uh, telehealth and, well, more health, actually. Lots of health. <laughs> Lots yeah. of health. Uh, again, hello, <laughs> hello from Zurich. Hi from London. I think we do need to mention where we sit because in those virtual times, I think it does make sense to, uh, you know, give a bit of... I didn't less remote uh, flavor to that. So a uh, really good episode today. We've got Adam Bittlingmeyer, the CEO of Modelfront on the podcast today. Uh, I'm really, really excited to talk to him. Uh, he's one of the most knowledgeable people in machine translation I've ever met. And he's taught me a lot of what I know, or <laughs> at least pretend to know <laughs> about, <laughs> about machine learning and, uh, and uh, machine translation in particular. We are also going to talk about localize uh, with a K. Uh, mm -hmm. Localize a uh, you know uh, SaaS software as a service localization platform, and they raise some money. Uh, going to talk a bit about Google telehealth, like Google's push into telehealth, and uh, you know we'll let you know in a, in a second how that relates to the translation and localization industry. Then segueing on to uh, one of those machine translation papers, uh, which we picked up on, and, and they made a very bold claim um, on uh, uh, performance of that system compared to us humans. And then we'll move on to a company called Babylon Health, based in London, right? Based in London, yeah. Based in London. Okay. So um, first up, uh, we're going to talk about Localize with a K, <clears throat> a very um, kind of a newish company in this space. Well, actually, very new uh, if you consider the, you know, the all the 20, 30 plus uh, year old LSPs and and even some of the the, the older tech startups. So Localize with a K <clears throat> is based in Latvia, and uh, they just raised a six million Series A round. Uh, I don't think we have official confirmation on the valuation, right? Yeah, no, we don't. Uh, what, what's their revenue, or as they say in startup land, ARR, which is annual recurring revenue? So I think they've told us they've got $4 million in annual recurring revenues. Okay. And that is because, you know, it's a subscription business, so or like at least, yeah, it's recurring revenue. So it's not like uh, you're ordering with, with a one PO off. from them. Uh, it's not yeah. a one-off. Uh, so basically, once you lock in 4 million, it's likely you're going to continue to lock in those 4 millions. Like we said many times in the past, you know, Slater subscribes to probably 30 whatever SaaS uh, applications, and it's very hard to get uh, out of them once you really start using them in your day-to-day -day flow. I mean, there's, there's mm. a number of tools that we'd be yeah, we'd, we'd have real issues if we if we had to stop. So, you know, you're going to have to go and keep paying those bills. And that's, of course, where uh, Localize also wants to be. They want to become the kind of the centerpiece of, uh, of uh, some of the localization workflows, like many, many others do. And it follows in a, a round of, uh, or a series of uh, other startups uh, that got funded or, you know, somewhat mature tech companies like like Memsource. Uh, they, they raised uh, Kudo, the RSI platform. We got Intento. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I'm still at a loss to, in a, in a nutshell, describe what it is they're doing, rerouting machine <laughs> translation, and then localized with a C and, you know, uh, localized, yeah, localized dot com, dot com uh, mm -hmm. which all kind of raised some money within the past four to five months. So there's a mm. trend now really going and, and funding these tech components of, of the localization industry. So um, th is this the first round they raised? I think, yes, it's a Series A, and they were previously bootstrapped before this yeah. round of funding. Mm. So bootstrap means, you know, they were, um, yeah, well, they were paying it for them uh, by themselves, right? They started, um, they started on their own. And they can afford it. Uh, when I did some research, uh, we, we found that, that the co-founders, Petro Antropov and Nick Ustinov, those are, uh, they're serial entrepreneurs. Uh, so Ustinov actually is so the CEO, Ustinov, he 
he uh, created the first email service that got really popular in Latvia, like in the late 90s, um, inbox.lv. Um, and he also uh, created a roamer app, like for mobile phone roaming when that was a thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's might be still a thing in certain areas, but now with data plants, it's much less so. And apparently, according to a Forbes article, that was when he got the idea for localization because it was tough to localize the product for for that Roamer app. And uh, mm. you know that it, it's a kind of a typical story that people get, uh, especially on that that developer and tech side, that they get the idea uh, for a localization a company while they're trying to localize a product. I think for phrase, if I remember correctly, it was it was a similar origin story where they like they were annoyed that it was so cumbersome to localize an app or you know website, and then they they mm. started to fix it. They're and like, oh, we that, can we we can do this ourselves type of thing. Yeah, well, they probably did do it themselves, and they, maybe yeah. maybe better, or at least that's what they thought for that particular um, uh, uh, problem. And then mm. Antropov, he he was a co-founder of the social network OK dot. Are you, which uh, you know was a I'm not familiar with it, haven't used it, but it's apparently a, a large social network in Russia, which was then okay. sold to the Mail.ru group. He's also apparently involved in a, a OTT, like a streaming provider, MeGoGo. Um, so, long story short, these two gentlemen probably have the capital and uh, you know <laughs> to to bootstrap a company, which makes it interesting why they would uh, raise right now. Um, and mm. actually, I'm going to have to go in and look who they raised from. We don't want to rattle off the entire list, but it was, um, first it was uh, somebody called, well, it was it was a fund out of Vienna called Capital 300. And then uh, a gentleman called Mike Chalfin, who used to be with a VC firm, Mosaic, Mosaic Ventures. Um, and, now, and I think and, Chalfin was the actual, was the lead on the investment round. He was the lead in the investment round. The company typically goes in um, and part like partners with other investors on Series A rounds, I believe. Do you mean the company, the Capital Three Hundred one, or yeah, so Capital okay. Three Hundred? I think they typically co, what do you call it, co-found or co-fund, sorry, um, investments. So they kind of rarely go provide all of the funding themselves. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and and then there's a whole list of people that also co-invested. Um, and, and they call them high profile angel investors, but, you know, basically founder and CEO of Miro, uh, somebody from who used to be at Atlassian, former CEO of King.com, uh, Trey.io, Intercom, et cetera. So a, a, a long list of people that, you know, have a long track record in the tech industry. And, you know, I'm looking at that list and I'm looking at the the background of the two, uh, the two founders, two co-founders, you know, uh, from Localize. Seems like they probably didn't need the money, they, but they have now the network, right? They have a lot of people that are exceptionally mm -hmm. well networked and very, very, uh, uh, you know, have a very strong domain expertise and are now personally invested in, in the success of, of that venture, right? So very, very uh, interesting how they, you know, how, what the next steps are going to be. So definitely a, a big competitor uh, that's mm. that's emerging there. Uh, the, the website, so why, the, why would they sorry. raise that? Oh, sorry, I was going to ask. You said you didn't think that they necessarily needed the money and it was interesting that they would choose now to do it. So you think it's a bit more of a kind of marketing thing? No, I mean, well, okay. I mean, I probably should take this back. I don't know if they needed or didn't need the money. I mean, $6 million mm. still is a, is, a, is a lot of money, right? So mm -hmm. once you go into growth mode, then yeah, you know, having $6 million allows you to hire a lot more people. Um, yeah. My point is more there's so many uh, other angel investors, you know, mm -hmm. in addition to Chalfin and uh, the fund, uh, mm -hmm. that this just looks like they brought in a bunch of people that they trust and uh, whose kind of expertise and network they would value. So, okay. and I don't know how much they, 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 um, you know, they pulled out from from selling those companies we just mentioned before. But, you know, mm -hmm. if you bootstrap a company to the level they did in that short amount of time, uh, and and six million is not a massive round. It just seems like it's more. It's it's yes, you you get the money. That's great. But it's also you're, you're getting some of these relationships and uh, and connections. Well, they got the relationships, but uh, um, kind of that these people are invested in in making this a success. Um, yeah, makes sense. Pure speculation, but who knows? <laughs> I mean, they should go on the podcast and explain. Uh, so very slick. I mean, if you just go by the website and the UI, the, the little, uh, the, few, the, the few things I saw, uh, very slick. They got all those, you know, the APIs you need, a SDKs for developer. Uh, it's 100% technology company, 100% enterprise accounts. Actually, when we ask them, hey, do you have any LSP clients? 
Very interesting answer. It was LSPs come along with our corporate customers who pay the bills. So clearly LSPs are not a, a, a client segment for them. Yeah. So you no, know, I love L- that response. It's just I like, like it. sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they may be, I mean, that's what we, we spoke about before. It's like the LSP or the transit, they're a resource in a system that is managed by the enterprise uh, buyer, mm-hmm. right? And then, um, so yeah, in terms of the the product, I mean, they're targeting, or at least they start up probably by targeting like their fellow, you know, developers, uh, similar to companies like Phrase. Um, and uh, so it's not really a translator or, or LSP centric, but it's very much tech centric. Uh, who knows if they've already broken out of this niche uh, or this this space already, but, um, you know, they probably will, because it seems like they, they have a pretty uh, strong uh, uh, growth trajectory at the moment. So Long story short, really a lot of activity in the TMS space. Very interesting funding. Uh, you know, looking forward to covering that company much more uh, in in the future. So, yeah. Moving on to uh, totally different space, telehealth. <laughs> so, just briefly. Telehealth. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting place. So Google uh, invested mm. 100 million dollars in a in a company called Amwell, which. Literally the same day they announced the Google investment, they also filed for uh, an IPO in the US. And so Google Cloud announced that investment. And they're saying that Google Cloud and Amwell see an opportunity to improve patient and clinical telehealth experiences through technologies that provide, and then provide automated language translation services. So Mm. what it means is, um, you know, we've spoken about this before. You got Stratos, you got Language Line, you got some of these companies that are uh, Syracom that are providing uh, this huge healthcare system in the US with language services, and yeah. uh, and now you got Google moving in and um, and providing. Well, I mean, just Google Cloud with all of these services they have. Among them, obviously, one 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 of those components is translation, right? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that. Um, from, from that point of view, for that uh, healthcare interpreting space uh, and translation space, so you got, you know mm. you got also s- startups like Boost Lingo and some other startups that who knows maybe it's not an immediate threat, but it may be something that's coming down the pike in the next two to three years. Um, yeah, and also these like hundreds uh, of small uh, interpreting companies. Just briefly, because I really want to talk about that. M- paper with Adam <laughs> later on. Yeah. Why don't we talk a bit about that paper that just came out? I think we ran the story a couple of hours ago or, uh, yeah, I mean, well, we're yes, recording. yesterday, if you're listening to the pod on Friday. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. And if you're listening to it on Friday, but, um, uh, yeah, what was that about? Can you just give us the high level overview here? Yes, I will do my best, but I think it will be good to unpack this, like you say, with, uh, with Adam. Um, sure. so this was, um, yeah, research Qubit. Uh, it's called Qubit. Cub, 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 Qubit. Cubit. I was. <laughs> How do you spell it? I was str- C U B B I T T. I'm sure it stands for something. Um, anyway, it's a new transformer-based uh, deep learning system, um, and the paper was authored by a couple of um, people from Google. And um, so you had Lukash Kaiser from Google, and also um, Jakob. Right of Google Brain Berlin, Berlin. Did I do okay there? Ish. Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know why I decided to read out the names when I haven't actually uh, read them before. And um, also somebody from the Charles University in Prague. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's talking about kind of transforming machine translation. Um, but I suppose the biggest headline is that they have claimed that their system outperforms humans. And then there's a few huge caveats in terms of when and how it specifically outperforms humans. That's yeah. my take on it. Now look, look, and I mean, we're going to talk about the merits of the paper and, and, and a lot of other MT stuff with Adam in, in just a bit, but... Um, when we, we we've kind of t- taken a step back on covering a lot of this MT uh, research because it it just I mean there's so much and it, it's very geeky and it's very hard for us to parse like what's actually an incremental addition what's in a sense meaningless what is just an academic exercise and what is truly like uh, you know the new neural machine translation thing that's gonna mm. really impact everybody. Uh, this one though uh, really stood out because again it's the first time I heard the term outperforming humans, which yeah. is is fascinating on so many levels. It's almost like 
it's philosophically fascinating because what what does it mean? Like it's it's a better translation. Like it makes I don't you know you could you could go on and on about that. Like what what, is, what does yeah. it even mean? Like philosophically yeah. speaking, and <clears throat> well, that's why they need all of these benchmarks so they could actually pin down what they mean mean when they say outperform. Yes, yes, of course. If you look at the ben- I mean, like they said, okay, it's uh, it's the that WMT news task, which is like an mm-hmm. academic uh, conference exercise. Uh, uh, they're going through, and and there on a specific subset, it outperformed on the metric of accuracy. Um, mm. You know, uh, and the specific set of translators that were uh, engaged on that project. But but still, it's just it's such an interesting. Um, way of putting it that it outperforms uh, humans and actually anybody you know who's interested in the details please go and read a our article and b if you're adventurous read the actual paper <laughs> it's like 20 pages with with a lot of charts and graphs um so so what also there's a couple of other things so they try to mm. caveat it right and one yeah. interesting thing was that there's that they said that um um that basically many um that if if a human had an infinite amount of time and resources, they would always beat any MT, right? Mm. But many clients can't afford such professional translate uh, so, such translators, and LSPs they call them professional translation agencies. They're always the translators that work with LSPs. They're always under time pressure. Mm. And so I don't know that, why they met, brought in the LSPs. To be honest, uh, like I, I don't, don't really get why that is a factor. But well, and then they is. said. And their results show that basically the quality of LSP translation is not unreachable by MT, right? And then again, caveat, at least in certain aspects, domain and languages. So to me, that's an interesting take on the professionalism on a linguist who earned their living from translation, right? Mm-hmm. That, that was our take in a piece as well, because it means like, okay, so there's translators out there that could completely nail a translation, right? But a professional translator working for an LSP because they're under time pressure, they're somehow just not going to, you know, they're not going to deliver the perfect translation. So it's it's such mm. an interesting, you know, really a, a take a, away from the whole, um, um, yeah, it's more of a philosophical debate. So I think I'll, mm. I'm quiet now and we should go and talk to Adam about it because uh, he's the master at, at those and he actually knows what, what they did. <laughs> Let's move on to Babylon Health. Uh, excellent buyer yeah. feature we ran this week. So... What are your thoughts there? Well, thoughts? Yeah, well, What's going this on there? Is, well, I, I was going to say one company definitely not using machine translation um, in any part of their operations right yet is Babylon Health. Um, oh, really? So also, yeah. Oh, okay. Zero? So anyway, that, zero. That was my lead in. And there's a very good explanation for that, which is that um, there's a lot of adaptation that needs to happen. So they're rarely, if ever, performing one-to-one translation. So they're not using MT. Um, Anyway, so yeah, this was a buyer feature with Babylon Health. Babylon Health is a digital healthcare provider based here in the UK, um, in London, and they have offices obviously all over the place as well. They, I think, have four languages available on the website. So obviously UK UK English, US English, French, Canadian, and also US Spanish, Um, but their services are localized into 13, sorry, 15 languages across 13 different countries. Hmm. Um, so they do things like they would, um, well, they want to provide affordable health basically to end everybody or anyone anywhere. Um, and they do that by working with digital tools and providing video doctor appointments. Um, so that obviously there's a localization or language component within that. And they've translated approximately or localized, I should say, it's more of a localization task and um, 3 million words in the past, um, 18 months. Mm-hmm. So my guess is that it's been ramping up sort of, otherwise they probably would have given it to us on an annual basis, but it's probably been kind of ramping up more recently. Um, And we spoke to Michaela Simonelli, the localization lead at Babylon Health. Um, And so she told us a little bit about how um, the team operates, how things run there um, within the, the localization team. So they've got six people based in London and Austin, Texas. So the team is split across um, those two locations. And they mostly work on localizing the app, the Babylon app, um, things like the AI services, um, but they also occasionally work on marketing and legal and those kind of corporate documents as well on an ad hoc basis. Um, Interestingly, she she was saying that they work quite closely. So it's kind of a collaborative thing across a lot of different functions for localization. So they would work quite often with in-house doctors 
um, for example, who would validate the medical accuracy of the content that's been localized in their language. And then they've got sort of engineers um, and lots of, and obviously language experts as well um, to bring it all together. All right. So that would be a good client for localize with a K. Yeah. <laughs> they do use a T they do use a TMS. Um, we don't know specifically which one, but probably yeah, something but similar. Techie and then uh, you know, apps, uh, websites, mm. that, that's kind of the, their sweet spot. Uh, so it would be interesting to know who they use. They do sometimes tell us, sometimes they don't, you know. Let's ask them next time. Yeah. Okay, so let's go and talk to Mr. Adam Bittlingmeyer, CEO of Modelfront, in just one second. And we're back uh, with this week's uh, guest, Adam Bittlingmeyer, the CEO of Modelfront. Hello, Adam. Hi. Hey. Where do we find you? Yerevan, Armenia. Yerevan, Armenia. Wow. <laughs> You're going to have to tell us a bit more about that. Uh, I've never been. Have you, Esther? I have not. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that's a good place to start. Uh, Adam, uh, how do you get to be in, Armen uh, in uh, Yerevan, Armenia? Well, uh, there's not any great reason to be anywhere else right now. Uh, my wife and I, uh, she's from here. Uh, we do spend a lot of time here. COVID happened. I was supposed to go to, you know, for the Taos conference back to the Bay Area in March. Uh, COVID has... <laughs> Not subsided, and our customers are pretty much spread between uh, at, at when COVID started between the US and Europe, and now also East Asia. So um, there we go. This is this is nice and central. This is nice because last time we met, you were in Zurich, and you also I think you sometimes camp out here, right? You have a that's true. Yes. Yeah, that was that was that was a. That was great. That was that was about a year ago. I think you gave a presentation at uh, at the Google office here. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I just briefly introduced you as the CEO of Modelfront, but uh, why don't you tell us a bit more about you know your your background, professional, and uh, you know what what got you involved with uh, MT? So when I was in university, that was what I wanted to do. Um, I was in the US, so very young, like age twenty, and already had to think about what I'm going to do. And, sustain myself and I really wanted to, to go join Google Translate. Uh, I did succeed in getting a job at Google, but I had no leverage, right? I was about 21 and I said, eh, and so I'd like to join the Google Translate team. They said, no. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll come anyway. Oh, well. <laughs> and I did eventually uh, move to that team. I convinced them, you know, to let me join. They didn't really have a position open, but I think just based on like pure passion. They said, okay, this guy's like, just, he's just so motivated. <laughs> we'll let him on, see what happens. Um, and and that, that was that. So, okay, for Google, so wh wh what what location was that? Was that, that was not in Zurich, right? Was that? That was in the, the Mountain View headquarters. And Mountain that View was a very interesting thing at that time, right? To have translation. I mean, you know, it was Franz Josef Och and all of those guys, Jakob Uskarait, right? So basically a bunch of guys from Europe, uh, South Asia, East Asia, uh, all transported to this sort of monolingual location uh, to work on translation. It was interesting. Let's just take one more step back. Why did you get interested in, to, in translation? I think, I mean, you speak a bunch of languages, if, I, if I'm not wrong, right? We, we, we had yeah. a, yeah, you spoke to like people in Spanish. We had some Alemanish uh, conversations. <laughs> true. So tell us a bit more um, about that. Well, uh, my my roots are from Vojvodina, um, which is one of you know one of the more multilingual regions in Europe. Um, multiple alphabets too, unlike Switzerland, and more a little bit more chaotic at times than Switzerland. Um, and uh, I grew up uh, between West Berlin, as it was then West Berlin, and the U.S. And so th this has always been part of my life, part of my family, and so on. I do enjoy learning languages, I was very fascinated, you know, the first time that I saw machine translation. Hmm. And you, of course, uh, were all old enough to remember, you know, back in those days, it was really hard sometimes to get a translation, even for something simple, you know, that the kind of things MP does not make mistakes on, or like a noun, like how do you say coronavirus or something like this. And so this was always uh, super fascinating to me uh, from, from, from day one. I don't think uh, I'm especially I do, I do really enjoy it, and, and that counts for something. 
uh, learning languages, but I don't think I'm especially, uh, you know, polyglot compared to, again, you know, average person in Switzerland or, or in India or Nigeria. I don't, well, compared to the average person in London, you're, <laughs> you're definitely up there. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, but then you, yeah, you left Google. Uh, and, and what did you do after Google? I joined a startup, uh -huh. which failed. And I uh, got married. I had a kid. I was investing. Uh, I, I was uh, yeah, between Zurich and, and Yerevan. And... And then, you know, deep learning happened, right? Word to Vec 2013 was around that time and it was starting to, you know. And still, I mean, these things that had always bothered me with machine translation, I mean, the fact that it does not work in the real world, right? If I go outside here and just take a picture of the bus and put it in, you know, with a camera and put it into your favorite translation app, it's not going to work. Right? It's, it's probably won't even do the OCR right. And that was also happening, despite what you were reading in TechCrunch, right, this whole revolution. And then neural machine translation came along. I was started to work, picked up things that Lucia Spezia had done with quality estimation, saying, okay, can we predict when it's going to fail? Um, but it was very tough going mm -hmm. uh, back in those days, right, with uh, these statistical approaches, which required a lot of data, you know, roughly, let's call it a million dollars worth of data, which I didn't have. Um, so, but this neural thing was happening. It was not really improving the quality of the machine translations. I mean, not in the way that we could now say there were no errors, but it did give, you know, me and my co-founder much better ways to catch the errors. And so that's what we did. We kind of put two and two together and said, okay, I think we can catch this. It took some time. Uh, you know, roughly uh, six months to get out to kind of working prototype. Uh, but we did it and we took that massively multilingual approach from day one. We didn't really have a choice. You know, we're not going to deploy 10,000 models. Um, and, and, and we got that out and uh, we haven't looked back. Wow. So, so that's model front. So you, model front, you said you set that up in 2018 around that time or? End of 2018, we were you know, off the record, uh, poking into it. And then yeah. really first two quarters of 2019 is when we got that out. Okay. And so, and right now you're, you're in a kind of, you're, you're not in beta anymore. Like you, you have stuff deployed and you would consider it like a fully functional solution with the client. That's correct. Yeah. And I think we maybe, do still have that kind of consumer slash developer DNA, right? Like Google Translate, where we just kind of get it out there. Anybody can sign up at modelfront.com, can try the API, can see if it works. We're not saying like contact us and all of this junk uh, and then creating some fake demo around it, you know? Because yeah. I, I have to say with this technology, I mean, I, I always quote uh, Samuel Leibniz from, from Zurich, right? Yeah. Which is, it's the holy grail if it works. So yeah. the value is very clear. But there was always this question, like, does it actually work? Right. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we, as a startup, we had to, uh, you know, show people. There, I can tell you and do all these studies and all this blue score and all this crap, right? But hey, try it and see. So I, I, I'm just basically for the, for the listeners, I'm trying to uh, just kind of in a nutshell describe what it is. It's, it's machine translation risk prediction so that would to me that would mean it needs use cases with tons of volume right because it would that be fair like you're probably looking for very high volume um uh, scenarios where you can deploy that and so you know 95 percent would be accurate for that specific use case but then it would kind of like you know branch out the five percent that wouldn't work but maybe just tell us i mean is that remotely accurate and if not like how would you give like what's the elevator pitch for it, in a sense? Yeah, definitely. If we look at, I mean, we didn't invent this idea, right? Uh, I mean, Lucia Specia was working on it 10 plus years ago. Uh, it was developed inside of eBay, inside of Unbabel. It's key to what they do. Uh, Amazon now has something like this inside, as you've written about. Uh, Facebook and Google, Microsoft. So... Uh, yeah, and those all tend to be more scaled organizations, but and and that's also more our background. So that's those are the kind of things we thought about first. Yeah. But then people approached us who they don't even use MT yet, 
or they didn't before they started talking to us. So that's hmm. much more premium content. Uh, Global Doc, our partner LSP, the US, right? It's Xerox, Coca Cola are their clients, right? IBM uh, tended to, and its marketing material very conservative. And they started using model front for uh, post editing effort estimation, right? So now they could use MT because they could basically say, is this project a good fit for MT? Final validation because their clients are doing final validation. Actually, so they can say, "Hey, out of these, uh, it's you know the in-country marketing manager. Hey, out of these uh, ten thousand strings, here's the one hundred you better have a look at." Okay, very interesting. So, uh, so that's validation, and then I think another interesting thing here, uh, coming from the MT side, we always have this idea that humans, human translations are golden, right? Um, but then, why would you need validation if human translations are always perfect? And uh, obviously. And not always, and uh, parallel data filtering, right? So back at Google, when I would do error analysis sessions on web crawl data, of course, web crawl data has all sorts of problems. It's very noisy. But the idea was sort of, okay, but a TM, a TM is like, you can trust that, right? But actually, again, there are a lot of caveats there when you have a million segments, and we've never seen a clean one, ever. <laughs> yeah, I can believe that. So, uh, and is that scaled? You know, is a TM a scaled thing? I don't know. It is scaled in the sense that, okay, it's 10,000 segments or a million segments or 10 million segments, but it's an offline thing, right? It's still not scaled in the way that like all Facebook traffic is scaled. Uh, and that filtering has turned out to be probably the easiest way, the most common way that people first use Modelfront because you don't have to do anything. You just come to modelfront.com, you upload your file, click on get an email. So there's no integration. Okay. And so from, from a client perspective, like right now, it's mostly, I mean, it's mostly bespoke, right? I mean, you, you just said it's, but what, what's the typical account? I mean, without a name, like tell me a bit about maybe size, usage, how you service right. them. Right. So as a sort of, you know, coming from the Bay Area School of Startups, we do have this idea, right, that we should focus only on one sector or type of client or whatever. And as much as we've tried, it really has not worked out like that. Hmm. It tends to be very much like MT. Who uses MT? Enterprises use MT. LSPs use MT. TMSs integrate MT. Random developers who know nothing about the translation industry use MT. Okay. So it hasn't really uh, sort of snowballed into one direction. Get it. Got it. Well, it's also early days, right? And I mean, it's good that you have uh, various touch points and then right, probably right. at some point but, there will be traction. Uh, sort of as, uh, to give you an, a sense, right? Uh, of course, there are very small LSPs using or individual developers doing projects uh, like in Switzerland, banks, uh, uh, so FinTech stuff having to do with uh, finding translations of people's names to see that they're not on any list and so on. This is very often one direction. On the other hand, some of the names I mentioned you know, among those, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, who have, they have such technology in-house and mm -hmm. they still use model front or something. Okay. Interesting. So. So, because superior? One, like, really just a, very laser focused on that problem? Yeah, I think uh, it's a product, whereas whatever they have internally is like a model. So you can't drag mm -hmm. and drop something into it, right? And maybe it's not all languages or whatever. Maybe they don't even know it exists. I don't know. Get it. Well, let's uh, just move a bit more about to kind of the broader MT space. And I think we're, we're slowly uh, kind of stopping to use the, the term neural, right? It's kind of become the machine translation space again. And I mean, it's kind of implied that it's, it's got some neural component to it. So in fact, if I, sorry, if I can interrupt yeah. you there, but sure. very recently on, on Stack Exchange, the top uh, question on machine translation was, can I access SMT? Oh, wow. <laughs> Can I access statistical old Google, basically? And very respectable people from machine translation researchers answered no. But in fact, you still can. It's still and, there. Yeah, I answered that. But basically, the perception is that SMT is like not even available right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so how do you? How can you access it? Like, do you mean like it's an API parameter? There's an option, and Microsoft does the same thing. Interesting. But why would they still do that? So you, you have two models that run at the same time, or I like actually two, don't. Well, I, I'm curious. Know. I'm curious about that too. 
Yeah, not even two miles. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious, actually. If you don't know it, uh, yeah, then uh, <laughs> investigate, let us know. So, but generally, like, what's the state of things in, in machine translation? Like, where, where are we at? You know, who's driving? What are the big developments? You mentioned, like, mo massive multilingual, which is a term that's been around, uh, that I've heard more more in the past 12 months. So what, what's kind of the state of play and, um, yeah, in, in research and in kind of production deployment? So things have definitely gotten easier. I mean, it's much easier. Anybody can get a custom model today, right? These kind of things. But I feel like we're in the ceiling. Like we've exhausted the uh, this current paradigm. You have one line in, one line out. If you go from French to German, it still goes via English. All of this kind of stuff. It's not personalized. It's not based on what your previous translations are or anything like that. I mean, if we talk about the major APIs and the majority of the traffic. Yeah, just to clarify, you, that that's like for Microsoft Translate, Google Translate, when you're saying they're still pivoting, right? Okay. Right, and yeah. so definitely complex and all this is on the horizon, right? Uh, we were just on email discussing this latest paper from from Andre Boyard, Jakub Buskarait, and so on, right? Where they achieved, quote unquote, uh, you know, better than human on news. Yeah, we need to, we need to tackle that later separately. <laughs> <laughs> but so we'll get to that. But the point is right that they basically, yeah, they ironed out like all of the cheap errors, right? Um, yeah. And it's to that point. But as we know, there are you know the three causes of machine translation mistakes are bad data, which this doesn't really address. You know, regularized bit that doesn't really address uh, process issues. I don't know, encodings like or failure to put quotes around a, a, what something that's like a button name or something like that. And then um, the actual linguistic phenomena, long distance dependencies, morphology, and so on. And this addresses some of those. Mm -hmm. So I, I do feel that if we want to get to some next level, then it's nothing that's currently happening. And if I knew what it would be. <laughs> no, but it is very interesting that you'd say that because we kind of dial back our MT coverage a bit because I kind of felt I we don't have so much to add anymore. Like, you know, in 2016, 17, 18, even into 19, there was something every month, at least something that I felt, okay, this is important. Let's cover it. Let's geek out. Let's ask, you know, experts like yourself for, for their take on it. But like the past 12, 18 months, it's been, it felt a little more incremental. So it's good that, mm. that I guess this was not just anecdotal, but uh, now we're kind of starting to tweak Week, you know, like really bespoke problems, right? To uh, tackle those. But I think that's how technology works. And that means that somebody's working on, you know, whatever the thing that we eventually find out comes out, somebody, the person who's working on it is working on it now. You don't know what that is, huh? <laughs> Nobody does. They don't even know could it. be many things. They, we'll they we'll know even... when it arrives. So, okay, that, but that's interesting. So, so I'm also there's this enormous amount of research being put out, right? Is that what you mean when you're saying somebody's working on it? Like there's there's these papers, like every you know every week there's like ten papers. So like it's, most of them, I don't know how relevant they are, but like maybe in aggregate, like all of this work will eventually kind of lead to the next level. Is is that what you're saying, or is are those the people that make the the progress, or is it more kind of within the big companies, kind of the internal research units, or yeah, you know I, practitioners I, like I, you? I won't say like me, but um, there are certain uh, practical problems of scale and so on that push people who don't publish that many papers compared to the impact that they have to find new ways. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. You can't get away from that. And in terms of the quality, going back to like the state of things, like, like are we marginally above like let's say the 2018 2019 level or like is, is it like we had that step change in fluency with nmt and kind of since then like you know you i, I look at deep l i look at google translate yeah it's you know it's it's ironing out issues but sometimes it still breaks down it's I, I don't see a step change anymore is that your perception as well that like it's we jumped and now it's kind of fairly incremental on the quality side as well certainly for yeah. our clients you can't change the workflow just because things went from 85% even to 95%. Not saying that they add 95%, but you it, you can't say, okay, now we use MT for everything if you weren't fine doing it at 85%. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So how about big tech? I mean, Esther, I think we spoke about it before. Mm. 
Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's interesting. A few of the things that you've said about big tech, for example, well, even the fact that you worked at Google, plus the fact that Google, etc., are using uh, Model Front. What I mean, how do you think that big tech is looking at machine translation right now? In the grand scheme of things, do they care about it? What's your take? So from the LSP or translation industry side, I sometimes get corrected on this a bit because, I mean, they do have their UI strings, which more or less go through the traditional localization workflow with caveats. But in terms of the volume, of course, it's this um, web content, user-generated content, merchant-generated content. And that was, you know, machine translation even 10 years ago. It's default machine because of the volume, and it's always been that way. It didn't, humans didn't get replaced. And I think that sort of initial DNA plays in very heavily, right? That um, it was always machine and then they just keep trying to get better and better. And from the quality side, you know, which is what I focus on um, and what Lucia Specia now, she, you know, she's doing things with Facebook research, Facebook AI research. Uh, you see that they care a lot about these catastrophes, right? Because consumer, the quality expectations are not very high when you're translating a Facebook comment. But what you don't want to see as Facebook is something offensive. And we've seen these cases. The right? Thai Where case, huh? Yeah. The Thai case, China stuff, um, certain things with certain religions. It, it goes out of control. And, of course, the names of certain advertisers, uh, certain political correctness things in the U.S., these things you just uh, don't want to have. So... That's, but these don't happen very often. It doesn't come up in a blue score or even in the human eval because it's one in 10,000, one in a million, one in 10 million. No. So it's more a case of sort of avoiding that next catastrophe. That would be that a lot of the area of the motivation for thinking about machine translation potentially, rather right. than thinking we're going to drive revenues based on offering this to everybody. I don't get any revenue from these things, from these integrations, yeah. right? It's the revenue is indirect because like more users, more ads, blah, blah, blah. And I see this mistake a lot too, that things like the, their quality is their only priority. And you have to understand the scale that they're operating at. And if you told them, hey, you can cut your machine costs in half and you're going to her quality 10%, they'd say, okay. Hmm. And now we're talking about Facebook, right? I mean, if you look at if you look at the well, Google or Amazon, uh, maybe they do have uh, an interest in kind of having this as a part of their cloud offering and like a, just another arrow in their cloud machine learning quiver. Right, right, like, right. But that's not a core business, if you know, I mean, of the company, certainly. And are, are these teams separate? Like, for example, at Google, like the, the what is it called? The machine... Um, Auto, auto ML guys are they would they be different from the Google Translate guys or is it kind of just one internal translate unit that works on this? Do you know that? Does one I, I'd know prefer, that? I'd prefer not to get into. I'd prefer not to get into that. Sure, no it. problem. I, I give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth uh, asking. No, but for example, with Amazon, I'm seeing. Uh, I'm seeing they're they're just like an announcement every other week around some new feature in Amazon Translate. So it seems like they're taking it mildly. Uh, sure, they've sure, taken sure. a mild interest I mean, are, in it. I can say there are multiple teams involved at those two, at both Google and Amazon. And mm. That's, that's not a secret. But then, how what the nature of the collaboration is? is... Yeah, see, that's, that's then, so interesting. No, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was carry on the conversations. So I was going to change topics slightly, but go ahead. No, I have one more. Uh, I have one more. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, like just from the outside, right? You see these big companies, you see that they're providing uh, translation technology and it, you just, it, it's always, it's kind of, it's difficult to understand, you know, if you if you look under the hood, so to speak, like what, what's the grand plan? Like, okay, you got Google Translate, uh, it's the, probably the most used general like uh, machine translation, uh, you know, application out there. But like, what, what's the grand strategy with them? Do they, what do they want to do, right? I mean, and this has been a question on many people's minds for 10 years, so... Um, and the, yeah, when they're moving into the more enterprise side, then the questions become even bigger for LSPs because they're like, well, I mean, do I actually really now compete with them directly? Um, and, you know, we just uh, spoke about in, in, in the podcast, uh, in today's podcast, actually, we spoke about 
Google partnering with a, a telehealth company in the in the U.S. and uh, providing like their uh, Translate API uh, for you know, telehealth applications. So that that is becoming a direct threat to like hundreds of like SME interpreting and, and translation providers, right? So you're you're seeing them moving more into those bespoke areas. Yeah, I mean, um, if I thought, I think generally worrying about competitors is not a good idea, and. Obviously, for us, as we're, we're like a mosquito compared to Google, um, you know, if I let that keep me up at night, I wouldn't get anything done. And they, you can always kind of win on your focus, on your customer service, um, right? On the fact that this is the only thing that you think about. So, uh, I don't, I don't necessarily see it. Uh, uh, and and on the other side, I don't think that. You know, Google is very interested in getting in becoming an LSP. No, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of LSPs. So, yeah, no. So what advice do you have for LSPs? How do you think LSPs should work with machine translation? I've been surprised to learn that it's not very, you know, as far as lo along as you might think. Um, meaning that either they're not using custom machine translation or they're not using machine translation or they're using it, but they don't know what that post editing rate is, which for model front is very critical, right? So like of your segments, what percentage have to be touched and what percentage don't have to be touched. And if I were an LSP, I would have that like here on the office wall and like every day when we wake up in the morning, okay, say, okay, it was like 74% were touched. So to think more about the, not not necessarily the edit. So you're talking about the edit distance and, and the time that it takes, or just does does that segment have to be touched? Yeah, I think all? more important than the edit distance is just did it have to be touched or not? Because that's what lets you, you know, then start to say, okay, you know, we can let model front approve these. Of course, I'm thinking it from that perspective, but I do know too, right? As a human, you know, there is sort of this leap between do I have to touch one character or can I just move on, right? So LSP, LSP should work with MT at all. Uh, like you're saying, there's probably you, you've you've been surprised by how little they work with it still. Or I mean, yeah. many do. They, they but, approach it the way I approach maintaining my car. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the least uh, least I never inspiration, the better. Hood, right. <laughs> and, but it's their main business, and you know. I'm not talking about automating anything, just the non-automated portion right now, the post editing, which is what they pay for, their main cost, is not something they track, really. Mm. So they can But there must be some that are doing it right. Are there any, could you there think are, of any are, good and examples just, and how that works? Um, you don't have to mention names. Yeah, yeah mention. I, I think the big ones, um, you know, uh, some of the mid-sized ones, some of those in Central and Eastern Europe, certainly. Um, so, yeah, uh, but as far as the, uh, I mean, there's another big driver. Intento just put out a great uh, little article on this. We've also put out an article called Machine Readable Text, right? Which is, you know, the basic idea, and that goes back to what I was doing at Google, right? Is that the input, the quality of the input determines a lot about mm. the quality of the machine translation. And um, LSPs don't have as much control over the input as enterprises do. Um, Right, but uh, there I want to say that even some very tech-savvy enterprises have very bad input. They're nowhere near this goal of like controlled language. Like if you have to like click, uh, I don't know, click save picture, it doesn't have something, some kind of tag around save picture to say, hey, this is the Y button, not part of the sentence, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Using uppercase instead of using a style around it, all this kind of stuff is just rampant. I mean, yeah, there are exceptions, but 90% of the time, it's just like the total naive approach, right? And uh, and this is again kind of you know why I say that these advances in MT aren't going to matter that much if we still uh, approach the whole the process side in this very sloppy way. Interesting. Yeah. So switching tact a little bit to um, it's it's already kind of a month old, but what what are your thoughts on that GPT three 
thing, which, uh, you know, I, I don't think I fully understand what it is, uh, <laughs> but it seems like it generated a lot of interest globally around, um, uh, you know, language and tech. Uh, and uh, also there were some claims that it helps with, with MT and people are asking me about it. So what is it? How does it matter, if at all? So at the core, it's a language model. I mean, the language model, the most obvious application of language model is the sort of auto suggest on your phone, hmm. right? which fills in the next word or the next few words, just more. And um, I think there's a lot of the same issues as with MT. What they have done well is made it easy, I think, and that's, I respect that because it's like model front, right? We didn't invent, you know, the idea of predicting good or bad, but we made it just a few clicks and you know cover all the languages and all that kind of stuff right and so they have really gotten it out there more scale than anybody ever had before um and the cool thing too is that you can sort of tell it what tasks to work on right so you kind of give this example uh say uh you know maybe turn everything into lowercase in one and then you continue and it'll do that on the next input um, but i see it a lot like how maybe how people outside of the translation industry CMT, which is that you know it all sounds really cool when you read about it in TechCrunch, and it's very different when you lose money every time it makes a mistake. Hmm. And my suspicion is that if you actually used it for any kind of thing where you would have to let's say correct it manually when it's wrong, then all of a sudden you start tracking what that number is and understanding you know, which kind of things it's wrong. About. And is it relevant to MT or not at all? Like it's it could do MT, but it it's just it's inferior to anything that's that's custom and specialized. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Um, and I do feel also that it's very much like the current developments in MT. That let's say one year ago or two years ago, we knew that this, we could do this. It's just basically pushing the current paradigms to their logical extreme. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's end on uh, that paper. We, we ran a story today for those who listened to it uh, when, when it's out, it's tomorrow. It's, uh, it's yesterday. Um, <laughs> and this is the <laughs> one, day, one, of the days. one day difference. Uh, so, you know, we, we had this whole cycle around reaching human parity in, uh, in, in translation or machine translation quality. And then it was the usual cycle of like mainstream tech blocks would blow it out of proportion. Uh, the researchers would push back and say, hey, 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 you didn't read the fine print. And then like we kind of try to make a little bit of sense uh, 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 of it, right? But now we have a paper that claims uh, machine translation outperforms um, human translation. And okay, granted, specific language set, news translation task and, and inadequacy. But what, what's your take on, on A, the paper? I mean, if, I'm sure you probably have skimmed it at least. And, uh, and, and like claiming like, it's better than, I mean, that's to me almost a philosophical question. I'll, I'll start with saying that the researchers, not just the ones who worked on it, but every single researcher knows very well that machine learning in general is not near human on even just comprehension, let alone the generation side. There are no illusions about that. What some uh, corporate uh, marketing departments do then in their blog, which is not a paper, but in the blog, that, that's a different a different story. What TechCrunch does is a different story. And the f sort of fake reaction, fake outrage to it is a different story. But um, so as a researcher though, researchers, what they really like is you give them a clear benchmark. You say, hey, uh, you know, this is the test. Now try and get the highest, you know, who gets the highest? It's, it's a ranking, right? And, and I think as humans, we always love this kind of thing, right? If you look at our sports and so on, the structure. And so these guys have done it. And hey, maybe they weren't even expecting it. It's not their fault that the thing outperformed humans on that metric. And if we, you know, true. they moshed up, right? This, uh, this kind of uh, metric, the, the yardstick is showing this result, then there's something wrong with the yardstick. Hmm. And they would be the first to say that. Um, and there were, there were plenty of caveats and acknowledgements in that paper um, regarding that. And so, again, I think we did just hit this logical extreme where, yes, on more boring stuff, I mean, it was news was where they did the best, and then sports, maybe where you had some colorful puns and so on. 
um, was where it didn't work so well. Uh, and that says more about the news and about the metric um, than anything. And so it's just uh, cleaning up. But yeah, no more dumb mistakes. If you don't make dumb mistakes, then you get to a certain level. And then, of course, humans, we humans, we do occasionally make just very, you know, kind of uh, space cadets and we make some silly error, right? And that's organic. That's fine. Um, and so you can sort of use that and get an edge on certain benchmarks uh, to, to be to be human. So. so yeah, so basically, it's it's the caveat. It's I mean, they did of course put it in. Um, you know, they added a bunch of uh, conditionals to it. I did find it interesting that I would actually uh, point out the LSPs. They said like the quality of professional agencies tra uh, agency translations, i.e., LSPs, is not unreachable by MT. Uh, so they basically said, okay, if a human had all the time in the world and all the resources, they would always be the machine, right? But under the kind of business constraints, they may actually get to that point, which is still quite a broad statement. I mean, I was looking for some qualifiers there, but actually there wasn't any. So, I mean, that's why we featured it because it's it was there were some bold, right. unqualified claims in there, in, in my view, which I found, you know, actually refreshing but, given given uh, some of these right, more, right. more geeky and nerdy papers we're looking at typically. Um, I, I agree, but I, I'd say the same caveat applies, right? So that wasn't yeah. just off the shelf MT. It was, you know, kind of the most boutique you know, star researchers, right? Um, especially trading on that problem, and a lot of, and, and I can say from uh, daily meetings that the same thing applies on the on the on the MT side and on the risk prediction side. We don't have endless resources to train because the models for people just like LSPs don't have endless translation resources. I think with that, that's I think they did say. That I was just going to say. I think they did caveat that sentence a little bit by saying that it is reachable by MT in certain aspects, domains and languages. So they still, they're still pointing out, I suppose, that it's very, it's potentially very niche and applied e to Eval is an unsolved use. problem, right? Uh, I mean, what, what, sorry, email, e eval, right? I mean, just oh, eval. you have one evaluation, right? You have, uh, this thing made this mistake on this line and this, but, and the other one didn't make it and now some other line. And then how do you weigh those, right? This one dropped negation and this one was great, but then one in one out of a hundred times it says the F word. How do you weigh all of that? And the, I mean, these are real dilemmas. Yeah. yeah. And, and so he, even human evaluation is not a solved problem. Um, you know, there's this question. Right when people use model front for for evaluation, it's like does it correlate with human evaluation? Does your human evaluation correlate with your human evaluation? That's a good one. Does it? Mm. <laughs> it, does it do does. That's like, no. I think there's a bigger <laughs> discussion to be yeah. had there about human evaluation as well because it's so subjective. And obviously, if you're delivering to a client, one a mistake that the client cares about is arguably you know a terrible m mistake. Yeah. But they might not care about something else, but a different client would. So right. and, obviously, and, there's the and subjectivity. We get this a lot, right. We get, I mean, consistency is important, right? Mm. And this was, you know, no context. We get this a lot too, where somebody says, hey, we always want, like, our, 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 our brand name appears with a registered trademark after it, mm -hmm. and we always want the translation to have that. And then you get their TM or their, their, their sample data, and, you know, it's a million lines, and like 10,000 of them have that mistake. And like, do you yeah. really want us to flag this and you manually fix all of them? Or do we, did we decide now that this isn't really as important as we thought it was? Uh, uh. Great. Well, uh, um, tell us what's next. Are you, uh, I guess we, none of us has major travels planned, but uh, tell us a bit more about roadmap and, and what's next, maybe towards the end of this year, next year with, uh, with you and the company. So, um, as I said, we sort of uh, go in all directions, uh, open to everything um, as far as, as, as the sectors that we serve. Uh, we are, uh, we have already lined up a few uh, partnerships with, uh, you know, more distributors, uh, TMSs, uh, LSP partners, um, and we'll do more of that. More of that will, will be announced and we'll, we'll definitely work more on that because it's just more scalable for us. Uh, definitely uh, making customization more self-serve and less upfront, right? So that you can run something, not think how you're going to customize it, and then afterwards say, okay, no, I'd really like to, you know, 
I don't know, enforce named entity strictly or something like that, right? Afterwards and, and without having to rerun everything. Um, yeah, and then error types. I mean, we get this question a lot, right? Which is, can you explain why this thing has a high, is a high risk? Um, and, and so that's, that's always been on the roadmap. Um, and it's it's not really hard. So as soon as sort of the market is ready for it, uh, we will we will provide that. Excellent. And uh, yeah, if if travel is allowed again, and you uh, you stop by in Zurich, uh, let me know. Oh, I will be there. <laughs> that, that's for sure. That's that's actually next. Great. Okay. Looking forward awesome. to. It. All right. Uh, it was great talking to you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Likewise. Thanks, All the best. Thank you. Take care.